Welcome to Lincoln Log, where we speak with leading historians and other officials about their stories, research, and wisdom. Expand your knowledge and indulge your curiosity here on Lincoln Log. This podcast is produced by the Abraham Lincoln Association, aiding and promoting Abraham Lincoln's life and legacy. Founded in 1908, the ALA remains the nation's oldest and largest Lincoln organization. Learn more at abrahamlincolnassociation.org. Greetings. I am your host, Joshua Claiborne, and I am pleased to welcome Stephen Smith to our Lincoln Log podcast. Stephen is the Alfred Cowles Professor of Political Science and Professor of Philosophy. Uh, He received his PhD from the University of Chicago and has taught at Yale since 1984. He served as Director of Graduate Studies in Political Science, Director of the Special Program in Humanities, and Acting Chair of Judaic Studies, Uh, From 1996 to 2011, he served as Master of Branford College. Professor Smith's research focuses on the history of political philosophy with special attention to the relation of religion and politics and theories of representative government. In keeping with that focus, he is the co-director of Yale's Center for the Study of Representative Institutions that focuses on the theory and practice of representative government in the Anglo-American world. Professor Smith, welcome to the podcast. So thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Well, we're very happy to have you. Uh, One of our listeners recommended you as a guest as a nice diversion from our normal crop of historians. Uh, (laughs) uh, Although you haven't necessarily published a a history book about Lincoln, you've certainly edited a nice collection of his writings and uh, written a few scholarly articles on him and chapters on Lincoln and a few edited collections on political thought. And most recently, you have a new book, Reclaiming Patriotism, in an age of extremes um, that may not be about Lincoln specifically, but quotes uh, quotes Lincoln and draws on his insights throughout. So um, I consider you anyway to certainly be an expert um, on him and your field certainly overlaps. Um, My first question may be a bit of an unfair one since um, I think it could almost be impossible to answer, but how would you succinctly summarize Lincoln's political philosophy? First, once again, thanks for uh, having me in a lovely introduction. Mm -hmm. Um, And that gives me a second or two to think about the question, (laughs) what what is Lincoln's political philosophy in a a sentence or two? Uh, You're right, that is sort of impossible to say, but uh, nevertheless, there are recurring and important themes in Lincoln's thought that uh, come up again and again. And one could focus on different ones, but uh, one that is very important to me, it runs throughout the book uh, that you mentioned, my new book on patriotism, uh, is the importance of equality in Lincoln's thought. Uh, Lincoln always referenced the Declaration of Independence and in particular its equality clause as the source of his political catechism, as it were, his political beliefs said in Constitution Hall in Philadelphia that he had never had a thought, politically speaking, that did not derive from the Declaration of Independence. And most of all, I think it was equality. By equality, I mean, that's a very vague term. It can mean any number of things. But I think Lincoln had a very strong sense of the equality, the kind of moral equality and the importance of human dignity. This is what was so offensive to him about slavery. Mm -hmm. Denied people their basic moral equality, Mm -hmm. their basic moral entitlements. It denied to them, to use a term he often used, denied to them the fruits of their own labor. And that was for him an affront to human dignity. So in the debates that we often have today about equality, whether we're talking about equality of opportunity, whether we're talking about some kind of quality of result, Lincoln isn't quite in either of those camps. He, he believed in base, a basic and fundamental moral equality. Each person had a kind of dignity that deserved attention and respect. So you asked, that's what I would I think of as the kind of core belief of Lincoln's political thought. Mm -hmm. Some have recently sought to minimize Lincoln as a philosopher. 
instead portraying him more as a uh, political animal, not a man of ideas. What's the difference between approaching Lincoln as a political theorist instead of a historian? Yeah. Uh, well, that's something I've, I've tried to deal with in a number of places. And, um, you know, in a way, the role of Lincoln as a political animal, as a political actor, and Lincoln and as, as a man of ideas, although there might be a different an emphasis in many ways, in Lincoln's life, they are clearly very much uh, joined and uh, link, linked together. Uh, I'm always a, maybe slightly uncomfortable in calling Lincoln a political philosopher. He had a set of political, he, he, there, were, there were certain basic ideas, beliefs, commitment, intellectual commitments that framed his statecraft. And I think with the source of his moral passion. And yet those were also connected with a shrewd and calculating uh, political sense. I mean, Lincoln was a shrewd political tactician, and you see that in his rise to power in Illinois, uh, as he rises, you know, through the ranks, uh, through Illinois politics, and then as he takes control and command as president of the United States, running, you know, running the vast apparatus of the government and the war. So the two are the two are connected, and I think it's a mistake to kind of to try to break them apart. Um, there is an, a tendency on some, the part of some political. I, I'm as you mentioned, I'm in political science. I'm I'm not an historian. Uh, there there is a tendency on the part of many political theorists to look at Lincoln's ideas. I I do think in a sort of abstraction from his. Uh, role as, as a political actor. Uh, I mean, I could be said in some ways to be guilty of that a little bit myself. We, we, we often take a particular speech of Lincoln's, whether it's the Lyceum Address, whether it's the Gettysburg Address, whether it's a second inaugural, and give a close reading of that speech, parsing its language, analyzing its, its ideas, but without necessarily um, focusing on you know, its, its immediate and even long-term political context. On the other hand, historians often tend to treat Lincoln simply uh, as a political actor whose ideas were treated simply as instrumental to the attainment of power. I could name names, but maybe that would be inappropriate. Uh, some very fine historians, don't get me wrong. Uh, and that, that also strikes me as equally false. I mean, Lincoln took ideas very seriously. He was a, mm -hmm. he was a reader. Uh, he would, his reading was, was wider and deeper than, than is often portrayed. Uh, it would not be quite right to call him intellectual, but he certainly took ideas very seriously. And I think those ideas helped to shape and to frame his, his statecraft. And in many ways, the challenge of anybody reading Lincoln, teaching Lincoln, writing about Lincoln to me is to hold those two sides of, of, of Lincoln's life together, both the man of ideas and the man who his law partner Herndon said he was a person who's, who had ambition, who, whose amb, ambition, was, was a, his ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. You know, holding those two aspects of Lincoln's life and mind together. Well, that's a great point. And I guess yeah, I, I really have always liked the, uh, the quote that Herndon, his law partner, offered that ambition was a, was a little engine that knew no rest. I, I really like that. Ambition plays a role, I think, for anybody who seeks to influence politics. But it's also, I think, um, at least when it's spoken aloud or acknowledged, uh, looked down upon. Um, how did Lincoln incorporate that into his life? And I guess maybe a related question, what can future statesmen and leaders learn from Lincoln, Lincoln's ideas about ambition? Well, ambition is a term uh, that comes up many times in Lincoln's writings. Uh, take just one example. There is a reflection he writes about his great rival, Stephen A. Douglas, where he talks about the ambition, each of them were driven, he said, by powerful ambition. He said, and, and Douglas, he says, has been more successful than I have. 
President Lincoln said. And you can see he's wounded by this. His ambition has been frustrated. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a term that he, he uses again and again. It's not something he hides from. Uh, ambition was not something to be denied. Uh, he was, he, he recognized and clearly Herndon saw that too, that ambition made up a considerable part of you might, you might, let's call it his, his psychology. Uh, what made him tick as a as a political uh, actor, political animal. Uh, but he also saw the dangers of ambition. And that comes out vividly in a speech that he gives, really what many people consider, I think is accurate to describe. It's his first major speech, the Lyceum, so often mm -hmm. referred to as the Lyceum Address of 1838, uh, the, the speech on the perpetuation of our institutions, as it's called, and where he addresses the, the person of, as he calls it, of towering ambition, uh, the kind of uh, military despot, the kind of potential tyrant and usurper, uh, who's not satisfied simply in preserving or perpetuating institutions, but wants to overthrow them, to overturn them in the name of his, of his own higher ambition. And the, the paradox is Lincoln recognizes that the American founders, Washington and Jefferson, others, were, were people like this. At least he attributes this kind of vast ambition to them. Um, that's what they were. Now the question is how to perpetuate the institutions that they, they left. And he asked the question, isn't it conceivable that people in the future, similarly animated by this kind of great ambition, can be a kind of noble ambition. Uh, won't they come along? Will they really be satisfied just perpetuating what we've got? Or won't they want to overturn things and, and establish uh, new, new orders to reflect their own glory and, and so on? And he realizes this paradox and this difficulty, how to control ambition and how to rein it and direct it towards Perpetuating, perpetuating our constitution and, and not overthrowing it. Um, I'll just say one more word about this. It's, it's become in many ways uh, almost inevitable that we read that speech today and to think that it was largely Lincoln reflecting on himself. Uh, was he animated really by this kind of higher ambition, this kind of uh, as he puts it, towering ambition that uh, would lead him and how he struggled himself to control it and redirect it towards uh, perpetuating uh, the founding principles and the founding doctrines. But, uh, you know, it's inevitable that when we look at that speech today, we, we think Lincoln is sort of uh, thinking about himself. Right. Well, I think we ought to give a, a plug here. Um, to an article that you wrote uh, titled Lincoln and the Politics of Towering Genius, um, where you focus on that famous Lyceum speech and address populism and uh, demography. Uh, of, of course, it's a timely topic, I think, for what we see going on in our politics today. Um, I, I find we often portray Lincoln as a mythical, uh, transcend, uh, almost a transcendent hero. Um, but as you know, he, he wrestled with the, a view of statesmanship that called for more moderation and self-restraint. In what way was Lincoln an anti-demagogue and how would he feel about uh, the politics of today? Well, you're right. He definitely struggled with this question uh, and in many ways was offered uh, one, once he was in power, particularly during the war, uh, he was offered many opportunities, you could say, to play the demagogue, to exercise tyrannical power of some kind, demagogic power. And of course, his critics then, as well as now, uh, have never ceased attributing this to him. Uh, whenever I teach my course here at Yale on Lincoln, uh, often on the first day, I'll, I'll ask students, what's the, what's the you know, what, tell me, what, what do you know about Lincoln? What's the, what's the thing that comes to mind? You know what many of them say? He suspended habeas corpus. I mean, that, that's what they know somehow. It's, it's, it's interesting. That's the first thing that comes to mind. What, wasn't, he, what, wasn't he a kind of tyrant? He suspended habeas yeah. corpus. 
And, you know, Lincoln's, again, he struggled with these questions of, of state statesmanship, exercising statesmanship, kind of constitutional rule, and the, the exigencies of war and wartime power. To me, the most revealing um, example of Lincoln's refusal to play the demagogue or to assume some kind of Caesar-like power occurred in the summer of 1864 when, in the summer, when the war was still not going that well. And he believed, I think, and many, many believed he was on his way to being a one-term president. Uh -huh. And those around him, or at least some of those around him, were urging him for exactly this reason to cancel elections. Uh, there had never been an election, obviously, in the midst of a civil war. And for some, it was an occasion to think about canceling the election. And in a memo Lincoln wrote, I believe it was in the aug August of that year, 1864, he said, under, basically, he said, under no circumstances would he cancel the elections. And that um, if he lost, if he lost, as he expected to do, he would work with the incoming administration to the best of his ability to ensure an easy transition of power. I mean, that's an extraordinary statement. He knew that everything he worked for, uh, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, everything he worked for could be lost. Right. And he, nevertheless, he thought that preserving elections and respecting the will of the people was even more important than that. And fortunately, of course, uh, events in the war were turned around rapidly in the late summer and autumn of that year. He ended up winning the election in a landslide. So his gloomy predictions never came to pass. But he was prepared to give it all up for the sake of election. And to me, that is not only a remarkable uh, feat of statecraft, but to bring it back to a point you made, it really is a great lesson today when uh -huh. people are challenging the election, their, you know, their, their preferred candidate didn't win, it was a hoax, it was a fraud. Think about what Lincoln did where the stakes were so much higher. Right. And you see, you see a man of, I would say, kind of sublime uh, character that comes out at, at that moment. Right. Uh, you, you pinned another a great article, I think, uh, an insightful one titled Lincoln's Enlightenment that you uh, focus on two speeches he gave during the brief period between his defeat for the Illinois Senate seat and his nomination as the Republican standard bearer for the presidency. And you specifically cite his enlightenment as uh, empirical, scientific, and progressive in spirit. Could you elaborate on those two speeches and what lessons we can draw from them? Great. Uh, th yes, those are two speeches. One of them uh, is actually a speech called, it's called a lecture in, in its title, which is interesting. It's a lecture on inventions and discoveries, or, or maybe it's discoveries and inventions. I can't quite remember. It was given several times, I think in 1859. Uh, and then the other speech was his speech uh, to the Wisconsin State Fair the State Agricultural Fair in Milwaukee, I think later in the same year. Uh, they're not uh, the standard speeches that Lincoln would give. They didn't deal with, uh, they didn't deal necessarily focusing on the, on the specific issues of the day. The Lectures on D Inventions and Discoveries is a kind of interesting speculative history of uh, a kind of a speculative history and the way in which the scientific imagination or maybe what we would call the technological imagination in some ways has been a kind of engine of progress mm -hmm. throughout, throughout time. And it's kind of fanciful in some points. He, he starts with in the Garden of Eden, he, he traces it back to the biblical beginnings. And when when Adam and Eve saw their nakedness and created, you know, the fig leaf, he says this was the first moment of discovery and invention. They they invented something, uh, a, a, a cloth, a piece, a piece of clothing to to hide hide their nakedness, 
And, you know, he talks about history as being the kind of progressive development of this kind of scientific and technological imagination. It's not an entirely, it's not a one-way story of human progress and human accomplishment over the forces of nature and the forces of, um, that, that control us. He, he also saw the, you might say, the, the dark side, what we might call the dark side of technology. And he talks about the way in which uh, the introduction of slavery and the slave trade in the modern European world discovery of, of, of the African, of, of, of Africa was, was a piece of, of this kind of, you know, uh, navigation and, and, and exploration. So science and technology and, and these kinds of developments are capable of having a dark side too. They, they created the new institutions and new categories of human beings, of slaves. So Lincoln saw, he was a cautious progressive. Uh, he saw history as moving, yes, in a, in a direction of progress and human and moral improvement. And yet he also saw it capable of, of revealing regression as well. And even mm -hmm. perhaps even new forms of tyranny unknown to ancient or, or, or previous times. So it's an extremely subtle um, I think analysis of the forces of history and the way history in its kind of broad sense has shaped the, the current debates about uh, the debates of the, of the mid 19th century that he, he was talking about. Mm -hmm. If we could turn a moment, I guess, to the, your new book, uh, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. Um, this may not be, a, this isn't necessarily a Lincoln question, but I think find it to be a provocative title, if nothing else. I mean, we live in a... Um, and really a thesis, uh, because we live in an age, I think, where patriotism can often be questioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as a threshold issue, why should we seek to reclaim patriotism? Well, that's a great question. It requires a longer answer that I'm capable of giving. But I think, I, I think for one reason, I think democratic societies in particular uh, require a kind of patriotic spirit to sustain themselves over time. Uh, all of the, here, here's an area where, you know, the study of the history of political philosophy uh, comes, becomes relevant because all of the great political theorists who thought about democracy or some kind of Republican government, going back to the Romans, going, going through my, people like Machiavelli and Rousseau, they all saw that the patriotic spirit was in some sense necessary to sustain free institutions. So there's a lot of history behind the claim that patriotism is something that we, we require and should be reclaimed. Uh -huh. And one of the things that led me to write the book is not only that patriotism is very much, in fact, in many ways has always been a contested virtue. Uh, I wanted to show what the contest over patriotism was between in many ways the critique you know, or, or, or the challenge I would say to patriotism from both the left and the right and the importance of trying to reclaim what, what I call in the chapter, one of the chapters of the book, a form of enlightened patriotism, mm -hmm. which is the chapter that draws mo most heavily on Lincoln because I think right. he was in many ways the model, my model at least of what patriotism can and should be. Well, if I could offer a, a quote on what Lincoln had to say about patriotism from your book, you write, no one has captured the meaning of enlightened patriotism more beautifully than Abraham Lincoln, who gave American constitutional democracy its highest and most articulate expression. Mm -hmm. could, could you elaborate a little bit on Lincoln's enlightened patriotism? Okay. Uh, I'll, let me just, you know, for the purpose of your listeners, our listeners here today, I'll, I'll try to summarize what I say in that chapter about, about Lincoln, Lincolnian patriotism. And I argued in that chapter that Lincoln's patriotism has three, had three components that I think are worth preserve, thinking about and preserving. The first of which is the emphasis upon equality that we, talk, we talked about earlier, the kind of moral equality and dignity to which each individual uh, is owed. Uh, 
uh, this, so let me go on then to the, what the second and third features of Lincoln's patriotism are as I understand it. The second is a kind of perfectionism. I mean by that, that Lincoln saw American patriotism as he saw the American Republic as aspiration, hmm. as its attempt to achieve a certain kind of ideal of what self-government and, and democracy would look like. As embodied in the Declaration, I would assume. It's embodied in the yeah. Declaration, but he also saw that too, in, the, in many ways, a little more broadly than the Declaration, uh -huh. because he saw that uh, that kind of moral aspiration meant the, the requirement of individuals to seek to kind of improve and perfect themselves through work, through study, through uh, self-improvement and upward mobility. Uh, Lincoln's patriotism was very much connected with this idea of a kind of uh, upwardly mobile uh, society based upon these qualities of moral self-improvement, self-development, a kind of moral progress that's, that's right. possible over the, knew it wasn't gonna take place at once. Uh, it it was, didn't fully exist in 1776, obviously. It certainly wasn't existing in 1860, but he did think that over time, Americans were capable of achieving a kind of moral progress through uh, the recognition of, again, stud, things like study, uh, upward mobility and, and uh, kind of responsibility to one another. Mm -hmm. And the third feature of, of Link, Lincoln's patriotism, I would argue, and um, was its, its inclusiveness. Uh, Lincoln, I mean, here's something that really speaks to our moment. Uh, one of the great political movements of Lincoln's time, of course, was the Know Nothing Party, as it's so called, uh, the American Party, which was in, which was an anti, essentially an anti-immigrant party. It was anti-Irish, anti-German. Right. The, the, the image it was an immigrant. It was a nativist party, and Lincoln was appalled by this. He writes famously in his letter to Josh Speed, I think, in 1845, that you know, once the Know Nothings get into power, he said, "I will prefer emigrating to Russia." He says, you know, an amazing statement. Uh, that, but that Lincoln's patriotism, as I understand it, is inclusive. He speaks to immig immigrant groups and he says, you know, I, I welcome you, essentially, I, I welcome you to the table. All, all it requires to be a, an American is, to, is an expression of our principles of equality and, and freedom and, and, and human rights, natural rights. And what an extraordinary uh, sense of the way in which Lincoln expand, extends his, his thinking and his understanding right. of the Declaration of Independence. He says to people of all races uh, everywhere, that's, he, said, he says that in the Dred Scott speech, people of all races. Uh, that was something the, the founding fathers had not really said. I mean, right. maybe Clyde and the all men are created equal, but who knows? Lincoln, Lincoln saw this as a, as a call for a kind of uh, inclusion in, in, in the American family that I think is, is absolutely inspirational. Right. Uh, the, the reader who was so eager for you to join our podcast um, submitted a question here also, and um, I, I share uh, this listener's interest in the role of civic heroes and what Lincoln called the political religion of the nation as the church has saints, so too the nation needs heroes. Um, and today, um, many Americans cannot agree on which figures we should be celebrating or if we should celebrate them at all. And as you know, Lincoln himself has fallen prey to some of that controversy recently. Do you think our civic culture needs heroes? And what purpose do exemplary ser uh, figures serve? Absolutely. Uh, you know, that's a a great question because you know there is a big debate uh, about whether heroes are, are a good thing or, or not not right. to have uh, for society. Uh, but uh, I do think it's important to maintain uh, an idea of people of exemplary character, uh, w wisdom, character, uh, who can serve as models. Not not I mean nobody's 
you know, it would be preposterous to say today we're, we're going to imitate Lincoln or, you know, we always ask essentially kind of what would Lincoln do, but who, who knows? And the answer right. is who knows what he would do. And the idea of imitating him in some way is not really plausible, but it's important to see how people of a kind of greatness uh, responded to moments of crisis, moments of, of great crisis. What Washington, I would argue, Lincoln, uh, I would argue, are two the, the two outstanding ones in our in our in our political history. I mean, we could we can talk about others too who are of a important but maybe not quite maybe not quite at that level. Names like FDR and Reagan perhaps come to mind uh -huh. in some respects, responding to periods of crisis and catastrophe that uh, require a kind of steadiness and firmness. And I think those, those are, are important. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I think the, the importance of, of thinking about um, heroes. And, and let me also say, I mean, Martin Luther, I mean, I, I just mentioned presidents. I mean, all of our heroes aren't, don't need to be presidents and in some ways maybe don't even need to be political figures really. Right. But certainly, certainly Martin Luther King would be a right up, right up at the top of, of those who, uh, you know, really stood up to injustice and, and right. extra extraordinary cases. And of course, there are many people throughout the world we could, we can, we can look to uh, as models of heroism. I mean, you know, Churchill would be a kind of obvious example. Mandela would be to me uh, another uh, important. A uh, figure of kind of I would say kind of world historical uh, significance. So I mean, uh, th those would be some examples. I mean, they're all very different, and that's the point of it. Uh, there's not a one size fits all model that that you're going to put all these people into. They are responding to different situations. They have different beliefs and ideas. They come from different national traditions. And yet, there's we can see we can see greatness, and that's that's a thing that comes through. Right, right. I, I uh, question here, I guess, just uh, your own uh, personal development and philosophical development. I mean, w what first turned you on to Lincoln, um, and what was your your gateway, and how did that develop to to, to understand the, his importance to political philosophy, and then perhaps his his impact on your own personal philosophy? How much time do we have? <laughs> Uh, that's a, that would be, that, that, I love the question. Thank you. Uh, it would require, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of two or three moments along the way. Uh, Lincoln goes back to my childhood. I, I grew up in, in Chicago. I grew up in the, as a child in the late fifties, early sixties the period that marked the centennial of Lincoln's presidency and the onset of the Civil War. My father uh, was a member of what was called, I think it was a Civil War book group. Maybe these were popular at, at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember as a child, uh, you know, there were books about Lincoln in the, ho in the house. I remember um, one point where, you know, groups of men, they were all men, came to our apartment, uh, you know, and they were on the, in the, I think the dining room table with maps and they were probably studying some, you know, Civil War battle or something like that. So Lincoln, I, I sort of got a bit of Lincoln from my father and fr who was a uh, kind of Lincoln man uh, after a certain point. But uh, again, that was, that was as a very young child. I didn't, Lincoln was not part of so much my, education. It was not really what I was studying as a uh, coll in college or graduate school. Uh, I read in graduate school Harry Jaffa's book, The Crisis mm -hmm. of the House Divided. It's a very great book. A very great book. And it, uh, it was really the first book that I read that really showed me in some ways of the importance of ideas to the American right. political you know, American political history, and that Lincoln was a man of ideas. That was a very, that was a, that was a revelation to me. Still not something I was focusing on at the time. And then if I can flash forward, you know, 
20 years or so. Um, a friend of mine here at Yale in the English department, David Bromwich, he and I had been, this was now going back quite a ways, he and I had been talking about for some time uh, co-teaching a class. And I remember getting together, but we could never really quite figure out what we wanted to teach. And I remember getting together, we were having lunch one day and kicking around some ideas. And somehow, I don't quite remember how it happened, Lincoln came up. And we both kind of said, yes, let's, let's do a Lincoln course. Uh, neither of us were particularly well-versed in Lincoln, but that really began for me as, because it was a course that he and I taught together several times. Uh, we don't teach it together any longer, but we do, te we do each teach Lincoln. In, in right. Class. And really teaching Lincoln, learning, learning about Lincoln, teaching Lincoln, reading about Lincoln reading Lincoln's prose, of course, uh, this has been in many ways, one of the most rewarding parts of my, my career and write, the chance to write about Lincoln too has been you know, one of the most enjoyable and rewarding parts of my, of my academic career. So it's really been a, I can trace it back to my childhood, but uh, it's, been, it's been something that's had fits and starts over the years. Right, well, I'm glad you mentioned Jaffa too, because he had such a, monumental effect on me and my view of Lincoln and, and uh, really political philosophy generally. Um, well, uh, Professor Smith, I really appreciate you joining us. One of the things we'd like to end um, this podcast with is asking folks to share their favorite Lincoln story. So I want to give you that opportunity as well. Uh, the, the, well, there's so many Lincoln stories and I, you know, probably a lot of them are really, it's sort of like, you know, the things that Yogi Berra was supposed to have said. He never really said all the things. Right, right. Sort of right like, like Lincoln said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, one story I like a great deal, and I, I thought it was, it's funny and uh, kind of revealing too. And it's told by Herndon. Uh, so, you know, take it for what it's worth. I, I, I tend to believe it's, it's truth. Uh, it takes place uh, when Lincoln is still a young lawyer in Springfield. I imagine, I can't remember, I think probably in the early 1840s sometime, I'm imagining. And Lincoln was known at the time as something of a religious scoffer. He was not a church going man and it was thought he entertained kind of dangerous political beliefs. Right. And Herndon tells the story that a group of Link, Lincoln and a group of his friends, they used to gather around a store, I think. And one of them would maybe, it was like a kind of a conversation club, it sounds like. Uh, someone, someone would read a paper or they would maybe, you know, give a presentation of some kind to spark a general conversation. And Lincoln was going there to present one night and he was apparently going to give a paper denying the divinity of Jesus. Okay, wow. Something rather bold in the right. frontier world of America. And apparently one of his compatriots, before, he, before Lincoln was able to utter a word on it, but one of his com compatriots grabbed the paper out of his hand, stuck it in the furnace in the fireplace, burned it up and said to him something to the effect, if you read that paper, your career is finished. <laughs> 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 and uh, I love that story. Uh, right. I think I'm telling it more or less, more or less accurately. And of course it ties in also to broader themes about Lincoln's views on religion. You brought up the passage from about politi the political religion of the nation, that term that he uses in the Lyceum speech, and of course, right. heading all the way up to the second inaugural. And I mean, the question of Lincoln's religion is a fascinating question. How, how he went from, how the man who went from religious scoffer in the 1830s and 40s, the, the great skeptic, the great scoffer, uh, even, an, even an atheist on some readings, how he became the author of the second inaugural is just an extraordinary. Right. Which is probably uh, the most religious presidential speech we've had uh, uh, potentially ever, I would argue. Yeah. Without a doubt, without a doubt. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us. I really appreciate um, you coming to share your expertise. And I know we talked about your book and some of the papers that touch on Lincoln. I can't recommend them enough to our um, listeners who uh, would be interested, I think, in, in getting a little bit away from the, the, the traditional history and more into the political thought and philosophy of Lincoln. It's, uh, you've, you've done a, a great job, and I hope you keep up the great work. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And- Thank you for listening to Lincoln Log. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And if you like this podcast, please consider rating it on iTunes and leaving a review. This helps other people find the show.